um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, so that, that, that title is obviously a bit of a joke. Um, I mean, it's, it's true in some sense, uh, but perhaps a more, I don't know, representative title of, of this talk would be non-congruence subgroups moduli and the markup equation. So um, the hope is that by the end of the talk, we'll kind of we'll describe non-congruent subgroups and how how um, we'll describe an interesting relation between non-congruent subgroups of SLTZ and the and the Markov equation, which was <coughs> described by uh, by by Bill Goldman, uh, and, and in particular with relation to the, the certain conjecture of Borgain, Gabbard, and Sarnak on a certain strong approximation property for this Markov equation, and uh, the connection will essentially be mediated by this theory of moduli interpretations for non-congruence modular curves. Okay, so we'll start with something very basic. So gamma n, this is the kernel of the reduction mod n map from SL2z to SL2z mod n. And then we say that a gamma a subgroup, so this symbol means finite index subgroup. So a finite index subgroup of SL2z is congruence. Only if it contains gamma n for some n. Otherwise, we say that it's non congruence And well, you have SL2z, some the upper half plane, right? So if you have ABCD, it acts by Mobius transformations, and ABCD times Z is just uh, A Z plus B over C Z plus D. And so you get an action of any finite index subgroup on the upper half plane. And so for any finite index subgroup of, F of the upper or of SL2z, you can consider the modular curve. You take the quotient of the upper half plane by, by this finite index of group. Right. So this is, we'll call this a modular curve. And then if gamma is a congruence subgroup, then this will be a congruence modular curve. And if it's non-congruence, then we'll say this is a non-congruence modular curve. And similarly, you can also define modular forms. Um, so these are just holomorphic functions of the upper half plane, which uh, transform in a certain way, which satisfy a certain transformation property with respect to the subgroup gamma. Um, and these, these modular forms have Fourier expansions. And essentially, up to this point, all of the uh, terminology, at least, is um, it works just as well for, for the congruence and the non-congruence case. It works uniformly well for any finite index subgroup of SL2Z. But this is essentially where the similarity, for the most part, stops. Um, the, the, the congruence case, if you were to study the congruence case, the, basically the, the next thing that you would study are the Heck operators. And this, this theory seems to be largely missing uh, for the, for the non-congruence case. Though it's, um, <clears throat> at least in general, there's no, I, I, um, you don't expect there to be sort of a general, uh, you don't expect for all non-congruence modular curves to have a good theory of uh, Hecke operators in some sense. Yeah. Does congruence mean that it, it has one N or all N? One N, yeah. otherwise it would be the trivial group. Okay. One N, right. Um, and through, it's essentially through this theory of Hecke operators that the congruence case has had such spectacular um, successes in applications in, in number theory, um, the most famous of which is the, the modularity theorem of Wiles and, um, and, and the consequent uh, theorem, of, uh, the, cons the consequent proof of Fermat's last theorem. You don't need a gamma three, four, no three, right? No, no, no. Well, I mean, it's, uh, oh, you mean to define the modular curve? No. No, I mean, in your setting. Even in my setting, no, I mean, it, if it's torsion free, you're going to find moduli space. If it's not torsion free, you won't. Yeah. Okay. But um, I, I, a, I mean, to even connect um, these, this, this theory so far, this, these objects, right, these modular curves and modular forms to number theory, you need to first um, come up with arithmetic models for, for these modular curves. And uh, so you can show pretty easily that these modular curves, these are Riemann surfaces of finite type. So they're obtained by removing finitely many points from a compact Riemann surface. And so, in fact, these, these guys map to, um, to uh, they can be given, they all come with a map to P1 minus three points. Um, and, and so these are in fact algebraic curves defined over Q bar. And in general, for an algebraic curve defined over Q bar, you can give it many moduli or many arithmetic models as like an algebraic curve uh, defined over Q or over some number field. But in the case of um, the congruence case, at least, there's kind of a canonical one that comes from modular interpretations. So I'll, I'll, I'm not going to, the next 
part of the talk, I'll try to describe these moduli interpretations for all finite index subgroups of SL2Z, but let's let's just begin with a congruence case just as a, yeah, yeah, as a refresh. Even is not congruent. Sorry? This quotient can be still defined over a number of fields. Is that what you mean? Even, yes, it can still be defined as over a number of fields. This is just a consequence of Bailey's theorem. Uh -huh. it, it always maps to H mod SL2Z, and that map is a so, I mean, even 3 point Oh, okay, I see. So if I'm not covering, something different. Because we So we'll begin with the, the analytic theory. Um, so we'll just sort of describe very quickly the, uh, the analytic moduli of congruence modular curves, or in a, in a very sim simple, simple way. So let's, for, for a lattice in C, we can form elliptic curve in back every elliptic curve is given this way. That's the quotient of C by a lattice. So this is curve. And um, <clears throat> We know that E lambda, the elliptic curve given by C mod lambda, is isomorphic to C mod lambda prime if and only if there exists an alpha in C cross such that alpha lambda equals lambda prime. If and only these lattices are homothetic. Right. So we can identify identify R squared R2 with C using the basis. So the canonical basis maps to one comma i. And so we get an action of GL2 plus R going on C. And so it acts on lattices. Lambda and C. Uh, this action is, you know, it's, it's easy to see that this action is transitive. <clears throat> and so to understand this action, to understand this orbit space, let's just fix a particular lattice. We'll call this gamma or lambda I. This is just Z plus IZ. Then it would be easy to check that the stabilizer, this lattice, GL2 plus R. So the plus means positive determinant. Uh, the stabilizer here is just SL2Z. Okay. So, <clears throat> what does this mean? Well, since GL2 plus R acts transitively on these lattices, what you get is a map from GL2 plus mod SL2 Z. This maps to the set of all lattices. Uh, of all lattices lambda and C. This is a bijection. Right? Extrinsively on, on the set of lattices, a stabilizer of a particular lattice is SL2 Z. And then if you want to understand uh, the moduli of elliptic curves, you want to, if you want to classify not only lattices, but elliptic curves, then you also have to allow for homothetic. So if you want to consider lattices of homothetic, then on the left-hand side, you'll have to further mod out by something else. Uh, in this case, you have to mod out by C cross, right? Here, you should think of C cross as sitting inside GL2 plus R as the product of the uh, scalar matrices with SO2R. And in this case, what you get is that this is a bijection of this set of all isomorphism classes. Um, so, since uh, so viewing C cross as really being identified as the, the subgroup of scalar matrices with SL2R, then you can see that this is just the upper half plane, right? This part is just the upper half plane, and this whole thing is really just the upper half plane modular of the action of SL2Z. And, um, and this map, and this, uh, this quotient is isomorphic to C, this, uh, the isomorphism given by the J function. A certain function on the upper half plane, a holomorphic function on the upper half plane, which is invariant under the action of SL2Z. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here, um, okay. And this, this thing we'll also call, give this, give this another name, we'll call M1. This is the course. Space. Olympic. So if you want to get congruent subgroups or a finite index subgroups of SL2Z, you can do something similar. So you can consider, if you consider the GL2 plus R action on not just lattices, but let's say pairs of lattices, right? Uh, lambda prime and lambda, where lambda prime is an index P sublattice. 
And what you'll find is that, again, you can calculate that this action is actually transitive on the set of all uh, such pairs. And what then you'll get is delta plus r. So you're calculating for homothetic uh, forces you to introduce this mod uh, c cross. And then um, in this case, instead of modding out by SL2z, you have to mod out by, uh, if you do the calculation, you'll end up modding out by gamma not of p. So this is by definition. So the matrices A, B, C, D, where C is congruent to zero. Uh, it's your prime. Sorry? P is a prime. Yeah, P is a prime. The transitivity needs it to be a prime? Uh, no. Okay. It's not. <clears throat> okay. So uh, and in this case, again, what you'll get is that this sort of double coset space will be in bijection with a set of all sort of these pairs of lattices. Right. Which is then. The space will be in bijection with a set of all lattices or these pairs of the, of the homothetic, which is then going to correspond to. Uh, set of all p isogenies of the curves. Some a suitable notion of isomorphism. So here, what I mean by isomorphism is if you have a p isogeny, so e1 to e1 prime, and then you have another isogeny e2 to e2 prime, then to say that these two isogenies are isomorphic is to say that there exists isomorphisms in this diagram. So this is this basically sketches out the, the congruence analytic uh, theory for the moduli uh, interpretations for congruence modular curves, right? So again, this becomes just the upper half plane mod gamma is not a P, right? And then it's essentially any kind of congruence uh, modular curve can be constructed in this way by when you, by considering the GL two plus R action on sort of pairs of lattices or or some kind of configuration of lattices. Okay, what about the non congruence case? So. I'm going to do something a bit different from what I do in, in uh, most of my talks. I've never talked about this analytic aspect before, but I mean, there are a couple of people in the room who are uh, familiar with Teichmiller dynamics, at least. Um, and so I'll, I'll describe this, I'll describe the analytic theory um, <clears throat> first. Okay, so again, I'm going to identify R2 with C, just using the standard basis, using the basis from the <laughs> Yes. When P is not prime, the action is not transitive, right? When P is, no, it's still transitive. I mean, if it is P squared, then there are two types of towers. One of them is like P lambda, the other one is P squared only in one of the bases. If I call lambda modulo lambda prime to be a cyclic group. So, sorry? If you should require lambda modulo lambda prime to be a cyclic. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, exactly, 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 exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So, yeah, what I really wanted were sort of co cyclic uh, sub lattices. Yeah. Thanks. Sub lattices with cyclic groups. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, in the non congruence case, we're going to sort of have a similar setup. So, like, in this case, we're going to, um, so instead of considering lattices, let's, let's consider. First, uh, let T be a torus. So this is a torus. So by this, I mean a two-dimensional real manifold oriented um, <clears throat> and zero in T and marked point. So you can have also an action of GL2 plus R acting on the set of translation structures. What does that mean? Well, a translation structure by this, I just mean a maximal atlas, right? As a real manifold, so it's a or a real surface. It's a maximal atlas. So taking with charge taking values in R two, where all the transition functions are translations. Okay. So on a torus, there are lots of translation structures. You know, any kind of uh, if you view the torus as being uniformized by R two mod a lattice, then this the sort of the tautological translation structure on R two descends to a translation structure on the torus, and any sort of translation structure on R two de descends to one on the torus. And you can, in fact, show this is effectively some amount of uh, some Teichmiller theory that this action is free and transitive. Okay, so just to give an example, from the translation structure, you can you can you can detect the lattice, and so you can, uh, in some ways, 
um, you can sort of draw a shadow of the translation structure just by sort of drawing a fundamental domain in a, in a very big sense. So um, this matrix, if you view this matrix inside GLT plus R, and the, the action of this matrix to, uh, to the translation structure on the torus that sort of identifies it with kind of a square torus will give you a torus which uh, can be uniformized by something like this. Okay. <clears throat> So we have this action on the set of all translation structures. Now, if you have a finite covering, so if pi is a finite, is a, uh, so let pi be a branched cover. So only ramified zero above this marked point. So we're going to call this, uh, so it, this is in some context called an origami. And we're going to use this terminology a little bit simply because it, it saves a lot of space. Okay. So um, let pi be an origami, which is just a branch cover of the torus, only ramified above, above the origin. Then for any such cover, you can pull back. So if you have a translation structure on, on T, then you can, uh, if mu is a translation structure, then you can pull back mu by this covering. And what you'll get is also a translation to structure on S, but with possibly finitely many singularities. So this is translation structure on S on uh, S circ, uh, which is just defined to be the pre, I guess S minus the pre image of the marker point. So um, <clears throat> you you might get some kind of conical singularities at the um, at the ramification points, but at least where the map is not ramified, you'll get an honest translation structure. Can you use gold on blackboard? You are talking about <laughs> almost the same thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very similar. Um, all right, so you should also note at this point that a translation structure actually also gives you a complex structure, right? A translation structure is, uh, I mean, this just follows from the fact that the translation in C is holomorphic. So translation structures give you hol com complex structures, but it's slightly more uh, rigid than that. In fact, you can show that a translation structure on the set of translation structures, which give you the same complex structure, is equivalent to the space of uh, holomorphic differentials on with some with some Maus conditions on your on your Riemann surface. Okay, so at this point, so what this so now you, you have this action of GL. So how does GL two plus actually I shouldn't I didn't say this I guess how does GL two plus R act on the set of translation structures? Well, given the translation structure, which is just this, this maximal atlas, you can just twist all of the charts by the action of some matrix in GL2 plus R, right? So if you twist, if you sort of post-compose every chart, uh, which takes values in R squared with some matrix in GL2 plus R, you get another translation structure. That's, this is relatively easy to check. And so what this gives us is this action gives us a family of what's called this translation, um, origamis or translate no branch covers of tori translation toruses which are only ramified about the origin so we get this family as a varies in gl2 and because this action up there is free and transitive this is in fact a representative this is this elements of the set contain representatives for every isomorphism class. So this, this is, or let me just uh, put it this way. This is the set of all translation covers. So translation cover is just a covering, uh, a branched cover with you know, translation, sort of compatible translation structures on, on the source and the target. So this is a set of all translation covers, which are topologically isomorphic. So topological isomorphism, by that I just mean, um, <clears throat> so again, it's the same kind of square diagram. So S prime, um, by this I mean, so if you have pi and pi prime, these are topologically isomorphic. If there's a homeomorph, if there are homeomorphisms, F and F tilde, which make this diagram commute. Okay. So this is a set of all translation uh, covers topologically isomorphic to pi. And you can ask a question, which is for which 
A in GL2 plus R is pi A mu uh, isomorphic to pi mu. Okay, so what do I mean by isomorphism here? Um, if uh, if I if if I if I mean translation isomorphism, right, an isomorphism which respects the translation structures, then of course th th this is a trivial question. The answer is only the identity, right? That's because the action of GL two plus R on the trans set of translation structures on on the torus is already just uh, it's already free, right? But here instead, I'm going to ask for a holomorphic isomorphism. So when is when when is there a holomorphic isomorphism of the corresponding branched covers of Riemann surfaces? So to answer this question, you have to introduce some additional um, the notion of an affine diffeomorphism. So an affine diffeomorphism of a translation surface, call it S comma mu. So S is a surface, mu is a translation structure, is a diffeomorphism F from S to S locally by affine maps in R squared. So locally given by uh, Z maps to AZ plus T, where A is in GL2 plus R, and T is in R squared. Right, so it's locally basically given by affine self maps of, of R squared. And this, this A is called the derivative for obvious reasons. This is called the derivative of the affine diffeomorphism. And you can check that when you multiply two affine diffeomorphisms, then the, the or when you compose them, then the corresponding derivatives are, are multiplied. And so what you can do is you can consider this group of all self diffeomorph the group of all derivatives of affine diffeomorphisms of, of S. So this is the group of all the derivative of F for all F in affine uh, for all affine diffeomorphisms. So, so this is a this is a subgroup, right, of GL two plus R. Okay, so here are some basic facts. This is, by the way, this is called, so this is called the Veach group. The Veach group of the translation surface. So, <clears throat> some simple facts are: you take this Veach group. And you consider uh, the beach group associated to the trans associated to S with the translation structure twisted by A. And this is just the conjugate of the beach group of S with the original translation structure. B, you have that the translation structure of a torus, sorry, the beach group of a torus is equal to the beach group of a punctured torus. So T, T circ means uh, the, the torus minus its marked point. And this is equal to SL2Z. Well, in general, it's conjugate to SL2Z, but let's say that so if mu is the square uh, torus. So if mu is essentially given by, um, if, if the torus is the square torus where the translation structure comes from, descending the translation structure on R squared down to, down to down to the torus by, by quotienting out by the square lattice. Um, and C, <clears throat> if pi from S to T is an origami, then the index, um, or actually let me put it this way, then the beach group of S mu is a finite index subgroup of the beach group of T mu. So here I should say S mu circ. What is the assumption? If pi is what? An origami. So remember, this means a, a, a branch cover of a torus only ramified above one point. Okay. In this case, then the Veach group of, um, <clears throat> of S mu is actually a finite index subgroup of the Veach group of, of T mu. This is effectively, this is a theorem of Schmidt-Thusen. In her thesis, actually, doesn't budge. Okay, so so we can actually use this to answer that that question. It turns out that the answer is it's 
So sadly, I, I had planned to use um, all the boards, but I think I'm going to have to erase some of this. Um, hopefully, you can sort of remember the, the congruence picture for now. We're about to get a similar picture in the non-congruence case. So the answer to that question, which is, for as you twist this, as you deform this translation structure, when do you get something which is complex, which is holomorphically isomorphic to the original cover? And uh, the theorem, which is essentially due to Smith Dusen, though she didn't, um, she didn't think about it in this way, is that pi a mu is isomorphic, holomorphically isomorphic to pi mu, if and only if a is in C cross times B group S mu. Right, so this is the beach group. This is the group of derivatives of all affine self diffeomorphisms. Essentially, what will end up happening is that somehow these derivatives of affine self diffeomorphisms they they give you kind of canonical representatives of mapping class group elements in, in, in some sense. And so what this from this you can get a similar sort of double coset moduli space description, where now instead of SL2Z or congruence subgroup, you get the beach group of, uh, of the surface. So we're going to say we're going to fix mu to be the square torus from now on. And so this is actually a finite index subgroup of SL2Z. Right. And so what this gives us is it gives us an isomorphism between or a bijection between this space and the space of all branched. Covers topologically isomorphic to uh, to so branch covers of Riemann surfaces of oh, let's say elliptic curves topologically isomorphic to pi and we'll, we'll let's just call this so that we have a name let's call this m pi it's kind of the moduli space obtained by sort of you, you start with giving pi, which was some branch covering of a torus, you first give it some complex structure, and then you deform that complex structure by, by sort of twisting by elements of GL2 plus R. And then this resulting space that you get is, is, uh, is actually going to be some quotient right of the upper half plane now by this beach group. Okay. So, so this, is, this is one way to, it, it, it turns out that these guys, which are finite index subgroups of SL2Z are generally non congruent So this is one way to, to realize, uh, to come up with non-congruent subgroups. And it's a theorem of uh, Asada, Holmberg, and McReynolds. Um, so Asada in 2001, and McReynolds, Holmberg, and McReynolds in 2012. So let's call this AEM. Uh, every Gamma finite index inside SL2Z containing negative pi appears this way. So this is this is a remarkable result. It, it basically says that every essentially every non-congruent subgroup, right? So note that negative i acts trivially on the upper half plane. So that just means the negative of the identity matrix. It acts at trivially on the upper half plane. So this means that every non congruence modular curve appears in this way. This is also called a Teichmuller curve. Uh, sorry. So you said that this gamma S0 is in general not so congruent, right? That's right. So, so in general, so I mean, from this theorem, right, you can tell that every finite index subgroup uh, literally appears in this way, like on the nose. It's not even containment. It's actually on the nose appears. And so, for example, any non congruent subgroup containing negative one uh, appears. The precise criterion of when this guy is congruent and when it's not. Uh, okay, precise criteria on the cover. I mean, that's a great question. And that is a, that is a, very, that is a very difficult question, which I have been thinking about for many years. Okay, so. May I ask? Yeah. Will you? You know, this SL2Z or GL2Z appears as the auto automorphism group of this free group on two JL. Yes. Now, there is a theorem which is kind of surprising from a fully group theoretical point of view that 
in spite of the fact that S that SL2 zero, GL2 Z has negative solution to the congruence mm -hmm. out of yeah. the automorphism group of the free group of the free exactly. Group. That's exactly if it's 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 this theorem? It's basically this theorem. Asada proved exactly the so, theorem that you that you mentioned. Ellenberg, Ellenberg McReynolds um, phrased it in this way. It, this this can be viewed as a strengthening of the congruence of group property for the outer automorphism model of F2. Can you explain? Because I mean, I know that theorem. Okay, so I think the best way to explain would be now to go to the next topic, which is the algebraic theory of module line. And from there, you can sort of describe, um, there it, it'll become more apparent in the setup. Then it will be apparent why the two fields are the same. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> So the next, so th this is the, the analytic theory of moduli, or, or this is one way of sort of approaching the analytic moduli of, of elliptic curves uh, with these sort of, uh, of coverings of elliptic curves, basically. And this is, uh, and these give moduli interpretations to every non-congruence modular curve. So this is one way to think about it. Algebraically, you can do uh, something. Okay, so algebraic. So here we'll just for simplicity we'll work over Q. Uh, as as, now everything will also work perfectly well in any kind of tame characteristic, whatever that means. So E will be in then with the curve. And uh, we'll let E circ this is going to be E minus the origin. So a little curve comes with a with a base point with this, it's a it's a group, so you can remove the, the origin. And we're going to consider the stack. ADM0 of G, so let G be a finite group. And what I'm about to describe essentially, if G is not too generated, then everything will be trivial. So really it suffices to consider cases where G is generated, G can be generated by two elements. So this in particular includes all non-abelian finite simple groups, or any, or I guess all finite simple groups. <clears throat> okay, so let ADM0 G denote the moduli stack of elliptic curves. Uh, sorry, of G covers of elliptic curves only branched of the origin. Okay. So here by G cover, um, again, for experts by G cover, I mean, in this case, it's a Galois cover of the elliptic curve where we fixed an ice, uh, an ice morphism between G and the Galois group of the cover. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there's a forgetful map, ADM zero G to M1. So M1 is the moduli stack of elliptic curves. So you give an action of the cover. Yes, so exactly. So, so this, an object here is a Galois cover of an elliptic curve together with an action of G on the cover, which realizes an isomorphism between that group and the Galois group. Okay, so there's this forgetful map from this, the stack of these covers. So moduli stack, this is really just, you can think of it, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with stacks, this is basically just, um, you can think of it as a moduli space, um, where you also sort of I, re remember the automorphism groups of the, of the objects. Um, we have this forgetful map, F, F for forgetful, Sends any cover to just the elliptic curve. So any cover of the elliptic curve, it gets mapped to an elliptic curve, and and this is a this is a nice map. This is a tau. In fact, it's proper and quasi finite. Uh, but there's there's a problem with it, which is it's not it's not finite. Uh, and essentially, what this means is that the automorphism groups of points here might be bigger than the automorphism groups of points there. And and this provides this, this is a problem because that means that this map is not finite at all. And we would like something which is finite at house so we can do Galois theory. So instead of taking ADMG, we're going to use MG to be obtained from ADM0G. And then you apply a certain rigidification. So this basically, so Z of G means the center of G. And it turns out that the center of G appears in the automorphism groups of every point. And we're just going to kill all these subgroups, um, the subgroups of automorphisms coming from the center. And when you do that, you'll get, so I'll just call this the moduli that of elliptic curves with T structures. 
the upshot is that this thing will now be quite a top. The modulus has to go Here. Picture is that now. Oh, so I guess uh, let me also mention the relationship with ADM zero. So there's a natural, uh, basically a quotient map from ADM zero G to MG, and this is a. Uh, so for experts, this is a Italger. Otherwise, you should think of it as just a homeomorphism. So it induces a, a homeomorphism on underlying topological spaces. Okay, so to describe the structure of these stacks MG, it turns out that the structure of these stacks MG is actually can be understood very concretely. I mean, so far this might be, you know, this might sound kind of complicated. There's some, there are stacks involved and so on. There's moduli theory of elliptic curves, but really this, the structure of these stacks MG, at least over C or over Q bar can be understood purely in, in, the, in terms of group theory. So to set this up, that pi, this capital pi, this will be the topological fundamental group of our elliptic curve E. Points of its with respect to some base point won't really be uh, the choice of base point won't matter and we'll fix a pair of generators so this fundamental group of the top of a puncture elliptic curve is a, it's a free group of rank two so we fix generators okay. and so then what we have is we have this picture mg right has it comes with a natural map to m1 the, the forgetful map and the point of forming mg was that to make this guy finite this basically means that this is an algebraic analog of a finite sheeted unramified cover, uh, or, or just a finite sheeted covering space in topology. And you can, so because this is finite at all, there's a, there's a, you know, the, the gamma correspondence tells us something, tells us that basically um, the structure of this covering can be totally understood by looking at the monodromy action of the fundamental group of the base on a geometric fiber. So we want to understand the geometric fiber. What is a geometric fiber? Well, by definition, what, how, do, how do we construct this map? Well, this map essentially comes from this guy over here, right? And so by, by from that definition, that means that the geometric fiber above any given elliptic curve, so let's, so this is a point in M1, which corresponds to uh, the, our elliptic curve E. From that definition, what that means is that um, the, the fiber above E is just the, the set of isomorphism classes of G covers of E. And again, by Galois theory, a G cover of E is just given by a homomorphism um, from E to the, or a, actually, I guess you should say a surjective homomorphism from E to the, uh, to, uh, from the fundamental group of E to, to G, up to some notion of, of, of equivalence. In this case, the notion of equivalence that we want to take is uh, up to conjugation. So this is going to be, this fiber is in bijection for the set of um, surjection from pi to g. But I'm going to put this x here. This x just means, um, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll just keep writing in g to avoid introducing too much notation. So it's going to be the set of home, uh, surject, surjective homomorphisms, so epimorphisms from pi to g, where pi is a free group of rank two, g is a finite group, up to conjugation, up to conjugation by elements of the inner automorphism group. And this is precisely F inverse of E. This is a geometric fiber. Okay. Um, what is the fundamental? So remember, we're trying to understand this, uh, the structure of this. So for now, let's just focus on the complex case. Right. Then to understand the structure of this of the stack, uh, again, by Galois theory, because this is finite at all, that means that we want to understand the fundamental group, how the fundamental group of the base acts on this fiber. So the fundamental group of the base of M1C. In this case, it's important to pick a base point, say based at this point, which is given, which corresponds to the elliptic curve E by, um, it's a <clears throat> follow from, let's say, Teichmiller theory, that this is a mapping class group of, of um, the punctured curve, which is also, this is kind of a, a miracle in small dimensions or small, small rank, a small genus, that this is also the mapping class group of the unpunctured elliptic curve. And so what this means is that we get this action of the mapping class group of E circ acting on this fiber. How does it act? Well, it acts by, let's call this action star. The star is given by 
Okay, so a mapping class group, remember, is just the, the group of uh, homotopy classes of self homeomorphisms of your surface, right? And because homo, uh, because uh, um, self homeomorphisms might move around base points, it doesn't act on the fundamental group, so it only acts on um, by, by the fundamental group here. I mean, this guy only does, doesn't quite act on pi. It doesn't quite act on the fundamental group of E circ, but it does act uh, as outer automorphisms on the fundamental group. And so this is given by the natural um, representation from the mapping class group. So the outer automorphism of pi. And in fact, what you can show is that this isomorph this this map is injective and it's an isomorphism onto the subgroup of orientation preserving outer automorphisms. So, so these are outer automorphisms which act with determinant one on the homology. Right, so this is isomorphic to SL2. Right, and this is an isomorphism. Um, and moreover, you can actually. Uh, this actually is actually very concrete. Let me just, I'll just write down some, some formulas. So if you want to understand this action, right? Uh, I mean, this is basically an index two subgroup of the outer automorphism group. Let's just try to describe the outer, the automorphism group of pi. The automorphism group of pi is generated by our three elements and this um, R sends AB perhaps to uh, A inverse B and S sends AB maps to BA. So it just swaps the two generators and then T maps AB to A inverse A. Okay. So by Galois theory, what this means is that the mapping class group orbits surjections of the conjugation uh, of the by G mod NG is in bijection with the set of connected components of MG back over C. And remember, this is also uh, equal to or isomorphic to the orientation preserving outer automorphism group of pi. And basically what it does is it sends the orbit MCG of some phi and just sends this to, well, what do you get? You, you kind of want to write H modulo the stabilizer action on phi, um, except that's not quite right. What you should do is you should take the the orbital quotient instead of the stack quotient, or instead of the normal quotient. But so this is this is the correspondence. <clears throat> and uh, what is the stabilizer? Remember, well, remember the mapping class group of the circuit acts. Um, okay, so I mean, how is this related to a non-congruence modular curve? Well, here, yeah. left hand yep. side. Yep. We are just basically talking. Uh, purely group theoretically are just all the possible epimorphism from F2 yep. to the finite group G. Yep. And on the right hand side. It's the connected components of MG, of the stack MG. Which has. This, this comes exactly from this Galois correspondence. MG is a finite detail cover of that. Kind of analytic structure or something, what we would like. It's a it's an algebraic stack. Uh -huh. um, you can think of MG is a disjoint union of orbital quotients of upper half plane by finite index subgroups of SL2C. So it's a disjoint union of, of these guys. So it's a disjoint union of one dimensional, one complex dimensional orbifolds or, or stacks. You can yeah, effectively a disjoint union of modular curves. If you have a coffee, it is possibly disconnected to find the connected components. You look at the power of the jazz acting on the side and then it's all. 
And this would be very special for two generators, right? You, you won't be able to do it. Right, exactly. We group on three generators, right. if you recall, because you take- Oh, oh, oh yeah. Um, right, I mean, in the three group on three generators, the, I don't know if the automorphism group or the auto automorphism group is really, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it acts naturally on a complex manifold or something. Um, so, so the natural generalization will be to generalize this instead of coverings of elliptic curves, look at coverings of higher genus curves, and then instead of getting the automorphism group on, or the auto automorphism group of larger free groups, you would get, yeah, you would get the automorphism group of, I mean, you would, you would get mapping class groups, right? But in higher genus, mapping class groups don't course, you know, the, the correspondence between mapping class groups and the full outer automorphism groups of the search group it sort of breaks down in higher genus. There's a- well, it's actually the stuff, it's, it's equal over there. Well, it has to- um, If you take a, just the, the surface- Yeah, okay, if you don't, okay, if, if you don't allow for ramification, then it's equal, yeah. But if you allow for ramification, you have to puncture it. Mm -hmm. And then it's not, it's not the full outer automorphism group, but like it has to preserve that. Is it really miraculous that for elliptic curves minus zero, you have this free group, but the monodromy mono mono is not a prolonged uh, zero, it's not an additional data. Any automorphism preserved uh, from the basic class of commutator. So it's only those which. which... And in higher genus, you have to with function, you have to give in addition to those country basic class of local. Quiet in those circumstances. So, in fact, that this is a very important point because it's what makes the problem hard because you are really looking at two generators of G and the action of your favorite uh, Nielsen moves on two generators, which is quite subtle. Right. Yeah. That's the T system problem. That's hard. Yeah. Uh, can I can I ask can I ask where does this distinction come up in the analytic uh, picture? So here well, you have this distinction. <laughs> does my question make sense? So Just here there is a big. Well, uh, here the, the here when you move from two generators to three generators, there are two. Th there, okay, uh, you you can modify. The algebraic picture and uh, look at three generators instead of two generators and you can also look at uh, higher genus instead of elliptic curves right. does uh, and 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 the situation is quite different uh, in those two cases uh, how does this difference manifest itself in the analytic picture that you presented first yeah so if you want to look at um three generators, or I don't know how to do three generators, but let's say four generators. If you can, if you want to consider four generators, then uh, naturally you'd be led to considering the moduli of, uh, of covers of a genus two, you know, curves of genus two with at most one ramification point. And in that case, the, the analytic picture, I mean, it, it, it would be different. You wouldn't be looking at coverings of toruses anymore. You'd be looking at, you know, coverings of genus two surfaces. Um, and then the, the, the type of theory becomes more complicated yeah, as well because GLG basically so. that's what Pierre said. Yeah. Because then you will not look at the full automorphism group, but only those preserving that's right. conjugates of that. In F2, there is this miracle that the, yes. the conjugacy class of the commutator is preserved by all automorphism, yeah. but there is no such conjugate, uh, there is nothing like that in the, in the, in the more generator, right? That's all the results. So, so the, there are these papers of uh, McMullen, I think, about Takmula curves of genus two. Uh, and that's the difficulty that he addresses, roughly speaking. Is it accurate? Yeah, um, in a okay. way, yes. That, does, that, 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 that work does address, does address one aspect of the difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so let me just like sort of formally describe how, how this is related to finite index subgroups of SL2Z. Uh, the point is, you have a canonical representation, which is an isomorphism of the mapping class group on the fundamental group as outer automorphism. And then this is isomorphic. This is one of the, this is a sort of a slow rank miracle that this is isomorphic to, sorry, the SL, um, SL of the homology of the group. And this is, of course, isomorphic to SL2Z. You pick a basis. 
And if you wanted to just consider the mapping class group of the unpunctured elliptic curve, you would only get a natural map here. So you would so, sort of forget about this picture. Right? Okay. So um, I guess I'll note here that if G is abelian, so we'll, we'll call these guys gamma phi's. So let's call let's call this these stabilizers gamma phi, and let's consider them as subgroups of SL two C. Because the mapping class group, I mean, this is a subgroup of the mapping class group. The mapping class group is isomorphic to SL2C. When G is abelian, it's very easy to check that this is congruent. Well, assume that the G is abelian. I mean, up to now, G was not abelian. That, that's right. So now, if, when, so this is a if, if G is abelian, that implies that, yeah, gamma phi is congruent. So yeah, if G is abelian, then it's congruent. So as just a specific example, then um, G is uh, Z mod NZ, what you would get is this is going to be conjugate gamma one of N. These are matrices where, which are congruent to this. These are matrices in SL2Z, which are congruent to this mod N, where you don't, you don't, there's no congruence condition on this guy. And then if it's Z mod NZ squared, then gamma phi is precisely full. Principal congruence subgroup of level n. And, and these calculations, right? How do you do these calculations? These calculations are very simple. They, they just come from, you think of uh, this is really the stabilizer, right, of the outer automorphism group of phi, of phi, acting on that finite set, which is a set of surjections of the conjugation, right? That's a totally group theoretically defined thing, right? It's really this action up here is really realized by the action of the outer automorphism group of pi acting on this set of surjections just by pre composition. Right. And, and from those formulas, you can kind of you can sort of understand very explicitly that you could write a computer program to compute all the components of mg for any fixed g. And, and I, I get this. I mean, for a bunch of g's, a number of various finite groups g. <clears throat> so it's also um, right. So another point is, of course, that so if g is abelian, you'll always get something congruent. If g is not abelian, you don't always get something non congruence the, the, the distinction between abelian and non abelian, or between congruence and non congruence is actually very subtle. So when G is metabelian uh, in a joint work with Deline, we show that, um, in fact, all, all of these components, all of these gamma feeds are congruence. Uh, but in general, there are even examples of, of groups where some of the components are congruence, and so some of the components of MG are congruence, and some of them are not. Um, so it's, it's actually it's very, it's very difficult to. It seems to be a difficult problem to classify to understand exactly when these components are are congruent. Okay. Can you use a five? So for a five, what you get is so you get three components um, of degrees I think like ten and eighteen and eighteen. They're all non congruent. Uh, two of them are isomorphic. It's uh, there are there are tables um, that I I posted somewhere and I can give you even more data. Um, so just you know. Numerology and it's it's very it's very fun and from this numerology you can actually tell things about like the fields of definition of these connected components uh, over Q um, and things like that. Okay, so this this work of Ellenberg uh, Asada Ellenberg and McReynolds really implies that. So another way of phrasing this is that every finite index subgroup of SL two C contains gamma phi for some phi. Um, and this, they, they describe this, the, the one way to say this is, this is called the congruence subgroup property or out, let's say out, out, out plus pi. So in general, whenever you have an automorphism group or an outer automorphism group of any group, you can ask about, you can define a notion of congruent subgroups for this automorphism group, right? Um, and these congruent subgroups, and this comes up very naturally when you want to put a, a profile topology on, on the, 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 uh, the outer automorphism groups of profile groups. And these congruent subgroups are precisely defined to be the stabilizers of these kind of surjections of the conjugation. And the point is that this group here, out plus a pi, is actually isomorphic to SL2Z. 
And in this realization, we're viewing it as a as an outer automorphism group of pi of a free group of rank two. In this realization, we're viewing it as an automorphism group of a, an abelian group z squared, right? And in these these two realizations give you two different notions of congruent subgroups. And with respect to one realization, in the in the second case, you don't have the congruent subgroup property, but in the first case, you do. So. Okay, so let me just sketch what. So I think I have until let's say twelve uh, twenty five because I started late. <laughs> okay, so um, this it, we're almost at the end of the first section. Uh, we're, there's only two sections really, so and the second section is shorter. So essentially, the, the point is that what we've done so far is we've started with finite groups G. Let's say finite two generated groups G. And for any finite two generated group G, we've constructed a moduli stack, MG, of moduli of G covers of elliptic curves only branch above the origin. Okay. These stacks are generally disconnected. So remember, the connected components will correspond to these, these out plus pi orbits on this set. Right. Um, so these are finite etal covers of moduli stack of elliptic curves. So finite etal. And group theoretically, this corresponds to the action of the out, out plus of pi acting on the geometric fiber, which is a set of surjections, conjugation. And in fact, this, this, fun, this construction is functorial for surjections of finite groups. So if you have a surjection to G prime, this G prime will correspond to some MG prime, which is finite et al over the moduli stack of elliptic curves. And this, in fact, induces uh, a surjection at the level of uh, of stacks, and this this surjection commutes with a forgetful map to M one. Uh, in fact, to see this, it's easier to go to the group theory side, and to note that well, whenever you have a surjection of finite groups, you also get a surjection on um, these sets of these sets of quotients. So this also surjects very naturally, and because the surjection comes at the level of G and G prime, this commutes with the out plus pi action. And so by Galois theory, that gives you this precisely this, this map. Um, yeah, so right. <clears throat> so that's that's the that's the picture. So it's, it's even subjective. It's, it's even subjective. This is due to a, a theorem of theorem of Gashutes or Gorsatz. Gorsat or Gashutes. I think Gashutes. Gashutes. There's a Gashutes lemma, which says that whenever you have basically what you have to show to show that this thing is subjective, right? Is to show that whenever you have a generating pair of G prime. You can always lift it to a generating pair of G. G. So if you fix a surjection from G to G prime, any generating pair of G prime will always lift to a generating pair of G. And that's that's a it's kind of a subtle, not a subtle result. Yeah. Yeah, and it also holds in the proponents. Right. Okay, so, so this is the end of the first section. Um, so when I when I realized that there was this very simple combinatorial description of these stacks mg of the you know, connected components and so on, I was you know it, it sounded it was pretty exciting right because you could at least compute with it. But it turns out that this group theory is this group theoretic side of it is is very difficult. Um, essentially, so that in fact there's a there's a survey paper of Igor Pack, who's a well known group theorist, who who described uh, who said it was embarrassing how little we knew about actions such as that. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out in, in, certain, in certain circumstances, uh, when G is say, so when G is a general finite group, it, it's, it's very hard to work with these sets. But when G is the, say the FP points or the, the K points of a linear algebraic group, where K is a finite field, the finite field value points of a linear algebraic group, then this set has some relation to the, the K points of a certain character break as described by, by Goldman in the, in the previous talk. Um, so let me just give a very quick description of, of what we have what we have in a specific case. So in this case, we're going to take G to be SL2 uh, FQ, let's say. Okay, so this is the FQ points of the algebraic group SL2. And we want to consider, just like in the last talk, we want to consider a certain character variety. So this character variety is first obtained by, so pi is as before, pi is a free group of rank two with generators A and B. Okay. And we want to consider homomorphisms from pi to SL2. 
Okay, so this SL2 is now a, an algebraic, you should think of it as a group functor, right? So really, it's, let's think of it as, as that, right? And you should think of this thing as defining for every, let's say, for every ring, you can you have a set of homomorphisms, a set of representations from pi to SL2 over that ring. And as you vary the rings, you get uh, you get different different sets, but these sort of these sets vary functorially. And so this this in fact um, is is represented by by an affine a, a very nice affine scheme, simply because this functor is really just given by well you just what does it mean to to specify a homomorphism from a free group of rank two to SL2 blah? Well, that's just to specify a pair of elements of SL2 blah. Right, so that means that this is this this thing is really just SL two plus SL two. Okay. Um, so this is the representation variety. So this is kind of a moduli space for all representations. But in our case, we don't want we don't want to consider all representations. We want to consider representations up to conjugation. And so we have to we want to quotient out if we want to relate those sets to something like to uh, to, to the say the FP FQ points of an algebraic variety. We want to quotient out by some by some notion of conjugation. In this case, the simplest way to, one way to do this is to quotient out, let's say quotient out by SL2. This is actually the same as quotient out by GL2 in, in, in this case. Um, and it's a beautiful result of, I guess, so I should add Vought, Vought maybe Fricke. So Vought and Fricke uh, knew, knew this following result in the, they did this in the complex case over C. And then this was also extended to the case over Z by Broomfield Hilden using uh, sort of more modern techniques in invariant theory, perhaps some of which are due to Duncan uh, and so on. <clears throat> um, and actually, this is a I'm sorry, I'm starting to, well, I, I can still attribute the following to, <laughs> to these people. Okay, so let's just say. Um, that we want to consider the surface. This is a Markov surface, right? Plus uh, z squared minus x y z equals zero. So we want to view this as a surface inside affine free space over z, right? So it's a it's a theorem of these guys that this uh, affine this this character variety for SL two representations of pi is actually isomorphic over z to affine free space over z. Um, <clears throat> and from this, you can actually show that this guy, this Markov surface, is, uh, it's, well, I mean, certainly a surface inside affine three space, and so it corresponds to a surface inside, um, a hypersurface inside this character variety. And in, in fact, this, this hypersurface has a very nice um, interpretation. I guess you can yes, so it corresponds to, you're right, so you want to basically, um, this is a hypersurface inside here given by uh, defined by the relation that the trace of the image so if phi is a representation that you know you want that, the, that you want that the trace of the image of the commutator of a and b so a and b are generators of pi so this is a commutator it's an element of pi so you want to take its image you want to take its trace and you want that to be negative two and that relation describes precisely this surface then, and moreover, not only is, is this true algebraically, it turns out that you can, you can show that, in fact, for all p at least three, you have a bijection. So that this is also sort of a correspondence at the level of rational points. So you have a bijection. So this is, uh, well, let me just write this, I guess. So from pi to SL2 p mod GL2. So here GL2. So remember here, this is, you want to think of this guy as parametrizing representations and this quotient as parametrizing equivalence classes of representations. So, so GL2 acts by conjugation on, on the target. So then for P at least three, we have a bijection from, from this set, right? This, this set just comes from well, it doesn't quite come from um, I mean, it, it looks similar to this, right? But to actually go from this set to this is it's a bit it's a bit subtle. It's not quite the FP points, though we'll actually show that it is. Uh, this is in bijection with the FP points of this Markov surface. Let's just call it X star of P, which is defined to be X star of sorry, X of FP, the FP points minus zero zero zero. So you want to exclude zero zero 
zero. So essentially, what this says is that every FP point of this Markov surface corresponds to precisely a GL2 equivalence class of representations to SL2P, which is surjective. Every so, which is surjective, um, with the exception of the point zero zero zero. That's the only point which does not correspond to a surjective representation. In fact, zero 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 will correspond to a representation which basically has dihedral image. This is also why you have to ignore p equals two. I think. <clears throat> okay, so. So at this point, we have this, uh, we have this bijection. Now, out, so as sort of described in Goldman's talk, we also have an action of out pi, right, acting on this, on the set on the left. In fact, it just, I mean, just acts by, by uh, yeah, pre-composition. So given any surjection, you pre-compose with, uh, with some automorphism of pi up to conjugation, and then you get an action on this. This, by, from this bijection, in fact, um, yeah, I guess you could say it this way. From this bijection, this also gives you an action of out pi on, on the Markov surface. It doesn't only act on the FP points. In fact, it, it actually acts on the, on the whole surface. In fact, this out pi action acts on uh, the full character writing. So in fact, you get an out pi action on the whole character writing, and this out pi action actually preserves this surface, this hypersurface given by the Markov surface. Um, and so the theorem, so in 2016, Borgain gathered in Sarnak, we studied this action. Um, <clears throat> they studied this action in 2016, and they, they showed that this action of out pi on this on the on the points other than zero zero zero, so it's easy to check. You can do you know you can do some calculations um, that this action of out pi on the surface uh, preserves the the origin zero zero zero. But then the question is how does it act on the on the rest of the uh, FP points? And what they show is that this action is essentially transitive. So that E E G S be the set of primes such that out of pi is not on star of f. Okay. And what they show is that this, this set is small. Uh, the first thing is that they show that this set is small for any positive epsilon, the number of primes p uh, less than, say, x, such that uh, p is in this exceptional set, which is to say that out plus out pi does not act transitively. This, the size of the set is O of x to the epsilon. So this, this set is very sparse, but possibly infinite. And B, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a large orbit C of P. There's one for every prime, uh, such that element of this large orbit it's very small. So essentially what they say is that A, the conjecture holds for all but a sparse but possibly infinite set of primes, and B, even if the, even if the conjecture were to, uh, sorry, I didn't even say the conjecture. Um, okay, let me say that. <laughs> conjecture. EGS. This was actually, uh, I think this was also, it was by Barrigar in 1991 which is that this exceptional set is empty. So what they show is that the, their conjecture uh, holds for all but the very sparse but possibly infinite set of primes, and B, that even if it were to fail, that the complement of this tr transitivity, you know, the, the, the complement, this, the size of this complement kind of measures in some sense the failure of this action to be transitive, that, this, uh, that even if it were to fail, it can't fail that, that badly. They were also able to obtain logarithmic lower bounds on the size uh, on the sizes of any orbit, right? If you can show that there's a polynomial in lower bound for some fixed exponent, then of course that would imply that uh, that their conjecture must hold, you know, from by b that would imply that their conjecture must hold for all but finitely many primes. Uh, they were able to obtain uh, logarithmic lower bounds, which was then further improved to slightly better logarithmic lower bounds by um, Vugin and Kanyagin and Sparlinsky and um, 
uh, I, I don't know the last, I've forgotten the last name. But, okay. So the, the theorem I, I want to just briefly talk about is the following. And from so every pi. So they were talking about out pi actions, um, the transitivity of out pi. In fact, we show that every out plus pi orbit has size converted to zero mod p. Right, so this gives you some kind of additional rigidity. And in fact, it gives you sort of a polynomial you know, a fixed polynomial lower bound on the sizes of any out plus pi orbit on, on that set. Uh, and so this implies that they're conjectured for, for all the finite many primes. Um, so as some direct corollary, so another way is other ways of stating uh, what this implies. So this implies uh, the PGS conjecture for all, but finitely. Okay. So the first thing is for all finitely primes, um, this implies that the, that this reduction map from the integral points to the mod p points is rejected. Okay. This is just a simple. This comes from um, a simple observation that. This reduction map is equivariant for the action of out pi. Uh, B, we also have that for a fall, but finally, finally many primes, we have an, another equivalent way to state this is that the stack M of SL2 uh, FP. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, say where the trace of of the commutator is equal to negative two. This is a substack of the full M and G. If you take this and you quotient out by GL to FP, and this is connected. So this is really the statement about a connectedness of a Hurwitz stack, of a Hurwitz stack of coverings of elliptic curves, of a certain Hurwitz stack of a covering of elliptic curves, in this case, SL2P coverings of elliptic curves um, with a fixed monodromy type around the branch point. Here, the, this specifies the monodromy. So basically, the, a, a small loop around the origin of the elliptic curve around the puncture is given by this commutator. This phi is a monodromy representation. So this is the monodromy element specified by that small loop. And then we're looking, we're fixing, we're considering the substack classifying covers whose monodromy elements have traced negative two. Negative two as an element of FP. You know if they are expanders? Yeah. So this is yeah. Um, no, I don't. I, I don't know that. I don't know that question. Uh, I think that. I mean, that would be a very interesting question. Um, and it would have some Diophanty, I think, applications as well to asking about um, the behavior of rational points on these on these stats. So before I sort of describe very briefly the proof, let me just describe some two applications. The first, the genus. Okay, so let me give this guy a name, MP. So that's a stack. You can take its course, course scheme, you got a scheme. This is a one dimensional stack. Um, I mean, these are finite coverings of the moduli stack of elliptic curves. The moduli stack of elliptic curves is basically like H mod SL2C. So it's a, it's a, it's a curve. So these, these are curves. So we can take the, we take the course scheme, we get a curve. Let's call it MP, uh, non calligraphic P or non calligraphic M. And this, you can actually calculate its genus to be one over 12 p squared with an error term, which is p to the three halves. Right, so, so this gives kind of, this is like an analog of Rademacher's conjecture uh, for congruence, for the genus of congruence modular curves, which says that essentially for every uh, genus, for every number of positive integer g, there are only finitely many, finitely many congruence modular curves of that genus, uh, up to conjugation, I guess, up to isomorphism. Um, or there exists only finally many congruent subgroups whose corresponding modular curves have that genus. And this says the same thing about, about this family of non-congruent modular curves. So uh, one question, of course, is are these non-congruent modular curves? We don't know. 
So in all practical examples, you can check that they are, and you can in fact prove that they are in, in many cases, but there are still a kind of a very sparse case uh, set of primes where I don't know if they're non-congruent or not, but we, we certainly expect it. Two, you also can look at this, uh, a certain congruence modular curve. So this is a principal congruence subgroup. But what, what, what you don't know, you don't know if, if, what the if these MPs, so these MPs, this MP is going to be H mod gamma for some gamma, yeah. right? This gamma is going to be obtained as a stabilizer of some surjection from the free group of rank two to SL2P. Right. But, uh, and so these are if, if it's a stabilizer of orbit, well, the in and the length of orbit is congruent. Uh, to one mod P, though, I think very few, there are very few. Uh, some in fact, no, 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 there's an easier way to see they're non congruent by the work of uh, Huda. Uh, can I say Sorry, something? We have to, um... uh, if I can say something, I, I think, I, I think, I mean, you can show that they're non congruent for a very large, for almost all the primes, right. but there's, there's still some ones that. Essentially, the, the only way I know is to use this theory, uh, this this theory of Doran Puder and Mary Chen, or Chen Mary. Yeah, yeah. If you, use, if you use Chen and Puder, you get the automorphism group is too big to be a congruence group because it's the full yeah. uh, symmetric group. So I think that it, at least if P is one mod four, it's non congruence. Okay. Um, so the other application, which is kind of interesting, is if you take the, the quotient of the upper half plane by this congruence subgroup now, okay, let's also intersected by SL2Z prime. So this is the derived subgroup, the commutator subgroup of SL2Z, right? This is an index 12 subgroup of SL2Z, it's normal. And, and this surjects onto H mod SL2Z prime, just obviously, just a canonical projection. That modular curve, that target is actually a once punctured torus. This is a, a punctured, a torus with one cusp. With one. So, in other words, there's only one puncture on it. One, there's only one point missing corresponding to exactly one cusp. I'm at infinity. And um, so, let mu equal let this be a flat, say, a square structure. I'm sorry, a translation structure. Translation structure on this guy. Okay. Then what you can show is that this, this precisely translates into some statement about the beach group. So if we call this thing y of p prime, this is, gives you something about the, the beach group y of p prime relative to the translation structure given by pulling back by mu under this covering map, right? And what this tells us is that it's p, p plus three, p, p minus three, p is congruent to one mod four, Otherwise, it's congruent to three if it's three mod four. And from this, you can actually compute. You no, know, so I, I, this is just a quick remark to people who do type field theory. This allows you to compute, um, for example, the Siegel Beach constants on on these uh, on these on these on these congruence modular curves with respect to this flat structure. Right. So what that means is it allows you to basically compute. It allows you to give you it gives you a uh, nice. Um, it gives you a expression. You can use this to compute an expression for the a very explicit expression in terms of like elementary functions of p on the leading on the coefficient of the leading term of the of the thing that counts closed geodesics on this closed flat geodesics on this congruence modular curve uh, up to some natural notion of equivalence. Okay, so these are the applications. Ah, so okay, so the proof. I'm just going to draw a diagram and then I'll write the, the, the result. Okay. The proof is that what we want to show, it reduces to some Galois theory. What we want to show is that any component of, uh, let's say, any component M of MSL2 P, that's with trace invariant negative two, we want to show that any such component has. Over M one to zero mod P. This is what we want to show. And the idea is to consider a certain diagram. So let's take this component. Well, it maps to the moduli stack of the curve. 
Let's suppose we have some family on the moduli stack of elliptic curves. Let's pull it back to a family on this component. Right, this is the forgetful map. So this is kind of some kind of family of elliptic curves over M1. This is a family which is pulled back as such. Here we have a zero section. Let sigma be the pull back zero section. Now suppose that this family, when you pull it back, you get a there's some kind of covering. Okay. And let's say this covering pi is only ramified above the above sigma with uh, monodromy. Let, let's say with ramification. Let's further suppose that we have a tau, a section here, such that pi composed with tau is sigma. So this is a section lying above sigma. And so this is, you should think of this as a ramified section. Then <clears throat> to get this congruence, what you want is you want to consider a certain line bundle. You want to consider a pullback of say the sheaf of differentials of E over M. Right, so this, this is a sheaf of differentials. You pull it back by this section. So really what you should think of is you have some sheaf of differentials on E over M, you kind of restrict it to the identity, to the zero section, and you have some kind of family of cotangent spaces. And so on the one hand, you can relate this to, let's relate this to the left-hand side. So this is pulling back by sigma is the same as pulling back by pi and by tau. So this is tau upper star, pi upper star, omega of uh, E. E over M, right? And then a local calculation shows that this is actually isomorphic to, uh, to tau star omega of C over M, tensor to the E. This is where the ramification, where you see the ramification. On the other hand, this can also be related. This pullback is also isomorphic to uh, sigma one. So let me just, I'll, uh, so this is also related to F the pullback of sigma one upper star of omega of of the universal um, of the the cotangent chief of this universal family, and this thing is precisely the hot bottle. Particularly, you have some notion of of uh, you, you can compute its degree in a certain sense, and so what this shows us. Is that from this you immediately get? Well, okay. So experts in the room will notice that there's going to be a problem in what I'm writing. So the degree of f, because this map is finite, it's a, in fact a finite Natal map. So we want to understand its degree, right? We want to show that this the degree of this map, right, is congruent to zero mod p. So the from but from this description, what we have is that okay, let's take degrees of this line bundle. The degree of the line bundle on the left hand side is the degree of f times the degree of lambda. The right hand side is just the degree tau upper star omega uh, c over m tensor to the e power. But when you tensor to the e, that corresponds to multiplying by e at the level of degrees, right? And um, yeah, um, and so okay, so so this is what you would, this is kind of what you would get. And so if you rearrange a bit, so you know that the degree of lambda is actually one over twenty four. This is just a, this is a standard calculation with modular forms. Say, and so this would be twenty four e times the degree of this guy. Right. So, if this were an integer, then you would get this congruence, right? Mod e, you would get a certain congruence mod e, and and this congruence is precisely what's responsible for this congruence mod p. Essentially, the idea is that um, when when this local monodromy element takes the form as trace negative two, it looks like Something like this. It's fun to get to something like this, where u is in fp cross, and this and this this guy has order uh, two p, so it's divisible by p. And this p, so this is the e that appears, right? This corresponds to the ramification index, and this p somehow survives through all the technical uh, considerations you have to you have to deal with uh, to get to give you this convert. So I'm gonna so I'll stop here. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm late. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a quick yeah. question? Yeah. 
I'd like to ask a quick question about application one. Okay. So uh, it seems to me that uh, the gene, so there is a Rademacher conjecture for congruent yes. uh, groups, and there is a proof of it by Zograph uh, using Selberg's theorem. So it seems to, so I think if the Markov graphs are expanded, this would imply that this uh, MPs will have a spectral gap. Uh, we, don't so, yeah. know that we don't know that they expand us, but I think the fact that the genus grows like P square can be viewed as um, indicating that there is a spectral gap. And um, mm -hmm. so is this uh, genus being P square an immediate consequence or um, how is this P square obtained from the main it's, result? It's it's obtained from very, it's basically Riemann Hurwitz. Um, but how do you how do you do Riemann Hurwitz in this case? Well, you, you have the, these are stacks over uh, MP is a, basically some ramified. Okay, so we're looking at the, the case of coarse moduli, right? So this is a ramified cover of H mod SL2Z. So you want to understand uh, this is only ramified above J, the J, uh, J equals 0, 17, 28, and infinity. And so you want to understand the actions of certain of three elements of SL2Z. On a fiber, and you basically want to count sort of when, uh, when, how many points are ramified corresponding, which corresponds to like how many orbits are there, you know, something like that. And these these kinds of actions, so you basically want to understand. Um, so there's like gamma zero. Let's say these are generators of inertia around um, <clears throat> zero, seventeen, twenty-eight, and infinity. And you want to understand the action of these guys: gamma zero, gamma seventeen, twenty-eight, and gamma infinity, acting on. This set of surjections. Well, okay, so a priori, it's just the set of surjections from pi to SL2. Um, but, okay, in this case, mod GL2P, right? But in this case, there's actually a lot more structure. This is by in bijection with X star of P. And the actions of these elements can be written down in terms of very explicit polynomials on X star of P. And you can actually compute using these explicit polynomials. It's kind of amazing that you can do this. Let, um, let, let me even uh, uh, say more to Alex. He knows what I'm talking about. I think that if you take an arbitrary, like fi even finite or finite simple group, then we cannot expect it for them to be expanders, even when they act on a connected, co even if you just reduce them to connected components, exactly because uh, the affirmative solution to the congruence of property for OTF2. Now, of out of two does not have property T, not even property tau, which means that finite index subgroups of that are not expanded if you take them as a total. Therefore, you cannot expect them to be expanded for all G. I mean, it might yeah. be that SL2P has some special properties. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, it, we can have, it, can, it can have analog of property tau. No. It doesn't. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, OTF two does not have property tau. I mean, that's not that's purely. Say, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, is there is a is there okay. something contradicting the conjecture that Markov graphs are expanded? No, uh -huh. no, no. That's because that's when G is SL two FP. It's okay. What 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 is the question? Which conjecture? About product is better. No, I am I am conjecturing that Markov graphs are expanders. I don't know which my collaborators. Are Markov graphs. Graph. So basically, the, the action of alpha no, on because XR. Markov are for SL two P. I'm not I'm not claiming about that. I said many, it, it, it's it's it cannot be just a kind of an upset nons, uh, a nonsense there. If you replace SL two P with some finer simple groups, and take SL five P. Then we don't know what's the answer, and I guess that uh, there you cannot expect it to be expanded, at least for some. I'm not sure. Right. So this is this connection is only for G, and this divisibility. That so uh, the the fact that the transitive action, which makes use of these formulas, was just for SL for his moduli space when G is SL two FP so far. I mean, that, like the, the number theory, like the association with the variety x squared plus y squared, that is from that 
It's yes, only for us to do. Yeah. Group theoretically can ask the type of problem for any finite group. Yeah. Then, but uh, we can also, you know, if we stay in SL2, then we know that for more than two generators, out of FK for K greater than three, they are expanded by the result uh, with Breyer. And I think, uh, I think uh, no, even now, even, uh, we know that the automorphism group of, uh, has probably yes, T. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about all this. Yeah. Uh, also, I mean, in line with that, those ideas, I mean, so this congruent subgroup property for out pi actually tells you that every curve appears as a component of mg for some g, right? So it basically means that if you want to study, there's nothing you can really say about these components in general. So really, if you want to get a rich, interesting theory, you have to restrict to certain families of finite groups. Um, so I, I, it seems like, you know, restricting to SL2P or SL2Q might be, might be a very nice family to study. Does that equality true when you replace P by Q? I mean, happy. The provide SL2 Q mod GL2 Q. Is that the same as the points of X star over Q? Uh, you have to be a bit more careful, but it's, it's almost. You, you get something like this, but essentially. Um, yeah, it studied. There's a paper of Wanderlei and Macaulay. Blah, some, uh, it's oh, included in our paper where they actually discuss it in depth. Yeah, it, it, you have to rule out the possibility that the image is actually SL2P and not like SL2P squared, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so to get surjections, you have to be a bit more careful, but something like that is true, yeah, if you're careful about it. Uh, so when you're talking about, oh, yes. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, so when you're talking about the corollary of your main theorem, so uh, Alex asked whether it's standard, and you said uh, this might have your funny applications. So what, what does that mean? Oh, so I think it being an expander means that uh, it, the, the gonality also has to grow. And the gonality growing tells you something about, um, this is like the work of Ellenberg and Kowalski and, and, and Hall, I think. And um, the gonality growing tells you something about sort of like rational, it restricts the degrees of the number fields for which you have rational points on these, so on these like curves. The so the number of the modular curve. Yeah, exactly, on the modular curve. Yeah. So, so for example, this already tells you, right, that for if you fix P large enough, that's such that this genus is, is at least two, right, then for any number field, there only exists finitely many elliptic curves over that number field with SL2P covers or of trace invariant negative two. So, so you already, yeah, so you already have that. And you, in fact, you, I expect all this to hold also of like any general trace invariant. So essentially, um, it's, it's actually remarkable that these stacks MG, when G is SL2P, if you, just, if you just look at the numerology, it seems to be very uniform. All the components seem very similar. Actually, they all have similar genes. They all have similar, and, and it's, um, in, in general, this is, this is far from true. In general, the components can be very, very different. Some congruent, some non-congruent. Mm -hmm. uh, so the computation of the genus, essentially you show that there's a lot of ramification in this map. Um, the computation of, oh, of this genus. Uh, no, no, MP to H modulo SL2. Yeah. Yes. There will be a lot of ramification, at least by order of two or order of three or order of Yeah, three. exactly, exactly. I mean, it's mostly at the cusps. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, essentially, there's very little ramification above zero and infinity, mm -hmm. uh, and above the zero and 1728. Essentially, it's just all the ramification is essentially at the cusps. At infinity. Or maybe. Uh, Okay, let me say the difficult part is at the cusp. I actually don't, maybe it's like there's, okay, yeah. Yes, essentially there's a lot of ramification. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We had a long day. Now we deserve lunch. <laughs>